My name is Vicki Oldham, and I founded the Looking for Angola Project. I started dabbling in history as a kid, and that interest in it followed me <laughs> until the point where I am today. But it was in 2002 that I was um, transitioning my life, and Sarasota County government was doing a documentary about the history of Sarasota. A script had already been written about the history of Sarasota. And I looked at it, they asked me to edit it, and I realized that they had, the writer, had black presence coming to this area during the Civil War. And I knew that there were black people here long before the Civil War, because when I had gotten out of film school, um, I did a documentary short about the history of black Sarasota and I was able to find out about the Angola settlement and so I interjected that story into the documentary about the history of Sarasota that the county was putting together and of course I had to corroborate the story with historians because they had not heard about it well no wonder it's a little known uh, almost forgotten story. It's, it was considered a myth here in Manatee County. People didn't even believe that it was actually true that anything actually happened. And so I got involved and corroborated that story. We put a small piece of the story into that Sarasota County uh, government documentary, but that the messages in that story kept nudging me, kept nudging about people in transition, people seeking freedom, people uh, wanting to, to uh, control their own destiny. And so I talked with the people that were working on the Sarasota County government documentary. They told me about a grant. We submitted the grant and it was approved and there we were off and running. And so when I come to this uh, ground, I think about the first survey that we did, which was across the street. I remember that day, it was so exciting. And there was a drumbeat of interest here in Manatee County, but still, but still, um, there was reticence to embrace um, this story about the strength of this um, independent freedom seeking uh, community. It has been, uh, yes, a research journey, but a spiritual journey too, to find um, this settlement and to tell uh, this story. We're here on the bank of the Manatee River, the south side of the Manatee River, river that at one point was known as the Oyster River because of the rich oyster beds on it. Thanks to research by Dewey Dye and Cantor Brown Jr., we know from archival sources that at one point there had been a maroon community here, a group of people who were seeking their freedom from enslavement by coming all the way down to what is the southern parts of Tampa Bay. Finding the actual location on this river was a challenge, and the challenge was met by doing archaeology. We started doing the archaeology by testing the area and then doing underwater archaeology. 
and through some good techniques, we're able to find some traces of a community that we know of as Angola. This community started in the 1770s. It grew in size over the decades to by 1821 being at least 700 people living from the south side of the Manatee River all the way down to Sarasota Bay. That community was destroyed in 1821, just as Florida was being transferred from Spain to the United States. And to a great extent, the memory of Angola was erased in this area. But it wasn't totally erased. The pine tree behind me is about 80 years old, and it was probably a descendant of a pine tree that in 1841 marked this part of the river, where just a few a uh, dozen meters to my south is a spring, the Manatee Mineral Spring. In 1841, two Anglo-Americans, with the help of Cuban fishermen, came up the river, saw the lone pine, got off in this spot, moved up to that spring, and then went about a mile more where they saw fields, fields that had been abandoned 20 years earlier. They have been planted by these freedom-seeking people, these Maroons of Angola. And Josiah Gates and his brother-in-law claimed this land and started building a community here that ultimately became the village of Manatee. That village of Manatee grew and grew until it became part of the city of Bradenton. So this is a spot that starts our understanding of a part of history. The name we use is Angola. We don't know it from the descendants themselves. We see it in the archival record. When Spain transferred Florida to the United States, they had to reconcile two very different types of private property. And so the lawyers involved created a land commission. And people living in Florida made claims to various lands. One of the claims by, was by brothers known as the Caldez brothers, who originally had been from Cuba, who had been fishing on this coast, and they claimed land here, which they called Angola. That claim was rejected, because they were not the landowners, but they were claiming land of the Maroons, and so we've used that term. The other name that's in that record is Sarasota, and Sarasota, as some of you might know, is unknown for its origins. I'm not sure when it started being used or where it came from, but when we started the project, the decision was let's focus on the name Angola, which is a West African term. It's not unusual. There's other maroon communities, including most famous in Brazil, that's named Angola. And it seems to be about a type of community that's mobilized and ready to defend its freedom. When the historians found the few scraps of archival information. It laid out the views of those who had conquered this area. Thanks to the work of Dr. Rosin Howard, we have a tremendous amount of insights for the descendants who had escaped to the British Bahamas and been living on Andros Island since the 1820s. We have some sense from them of their sense of identity and their commitment to freedom and so Angola is a term that becomes the name of the country in West Africa. And it seems to represent a sense of community and of freedom and liberty. And so on the shore of the Manatee River was a place of freedom, of liberty. And we're returning that name to this place through this project. So we had a real challenge in front of us to find the material evidence for Angola, right? So the historical record gave us a sense that there had been a community here, but that sense was somewhere on the Manatee River. And even that was contested because it was so vague. The maps until the 20th century are not well done, is the easiest way to say it. We knew that the area where the Braden River enters the Oyster River, now known as the Manatee River, was an important part of the Angola community. But that particular spot was taken over in the 1840s for a plantation big house. And then in the 1920s, tin can tourists came, and it's an area that's just overbuilt where there wasn't any potential to do any archaeology. 
So one of the best spots didn't have the potential because of development for archaeological excavations. The look, the search underwater in the river discovered that when the Army Corps of Engineers dredged the river in the 1890s and 1910s, they had done a really good job. The river was almost cleaned out in the bottom, so we weren't finding any clues there. We were incredibly fortunate that Reflections of Manatee, a nonprofit historical preservation organization run by Trudy Williams and Jeff Williams, had preserved the land around the Manatee Mineral Spring. They had a commitment to the history of the area and they wanted to know the full history. And Jeff and Trudy Williams invited Looking for Angola as a research project to excavate. We did some test excavations back in 2008, 2009, 2013, found evidence for the early 19th century occupation by the Maroons. And that's how we found it. The area that we're here right now is going to be part of Riverwalk, the entertainment district that's already in the further west part of Bradenton. So it's going to come all the way here and this is going to be a park. Because of the type of transformation of the land they have to do to make it a park, including creating lagoons because of rising sea levels and other concerns, the city of Bradenton funded excavations in January 2020 that allowed me to do even more exposure and we're still in the process of going through those materials. We're getting close, but we're almost there. And what we found and what I can share with you is our initial findings is we see the level, the layer, the landscape of the Maroons. This clearly was one of the areas for Angola, a community that spread from here all the way down to Sarasota Bay. So there's much more of Angola to still find, but the area here, we've already found some very good evidence. What we're dealing with is a time period in Spanish territory. So a lot of the terminology that we use in American English is actually cumbersome and sometimes not even appropriate. The term Black Seminole comes about during the Second Seminole War, 1835 to 1842, when the indigenous people and the people of African heritage rose up against the slave regime. And the term was Seminoles for the indigenous people, black Seminoles for the people of African heritage. The people of Angola, well, the community was destroyed in 1821. That predates it. Many of the people who were here had escaped after the destruction of Angola into the interior, and they become black Seminoles. Right, so we have this sort of questions of when do we use particular terms and identities. And we always have to keep in mind, right, it's a very cool, pleasant, sunny day right now, but anyone who lives in Florida knows in the summer this is pretty harsh. It's difficult environments. These were areas with a lot of danger, a lot of challenges. Uh, the people had escaped from plantations up in Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina. It's tremendous distance. Some were born in freedom here in Spanish La Florida. Again, under really difficult conditions, the identities were fluid. People were creating communities full of differences and making sense of them. The ones that escaped to the British Bahamas, living in Andros Island, build new communities there. The ones who stay in Florida, again, create new identities and communities. We're trying to make sense of a time period from the 1770s to 1821 where we don't have the words of the people themselves, only the words of the U.S. military that tried to destroy them. And so we're trying to tease through. And so my approach as an anthropologist is to allow that fluidity, right? And we have to think about if we use the number 700 for the number of people here, 700 different senses of who they are and how they told their children and grandchildren about what they did and how they did it. And we want to keep alive all that diversity as people are making choices of how to live in freedom with the active fear of destruction. So we want all that to come out, right? It's not a static moment, but a real dynamic moment and part of a longer history that becomes the story of the Black Seminoles, the Seminole tribe of Florida, the people of the Bahamas in lots of different ways. So much of the history was lost 
enslavement wasn't just about the brutality towards individuals, but the ratio of who people were as people. And there's a rich heritage for the Gullah Geechee to other peoples that this is part of. And the research is still ongoing to make those connections, to raise how much distance people traveled to stay together, to sustain their families, their identities, their sense of the future. And the Gullah Geechee are very much part of this. And the multiple languages and multiple choices people were making is all part of what we see in what's now just an empty field, but at one point had been a vibrant community. One of the archaeological challenges for finding Angola was that this was not an empty field throughout its history. The area that's right now under this cap is the spring itself, a fairly small spring, but a mineral spring that attracted people probably for thousands of years. We were not able during our excavations to find evidence of the Native Americans who were here, but we know from the 1930s, a local resident comment about a Native American mound that was near this spring. It was probably removed sometime in the 1930s for, to be used as roadbed, which is something that occurred all around this area. The remains of the indigenous people erased and covered over with asphalt. But we have a sense that this spring was probably important for thousands of years. And we do honor the native peoples, the Seminole Miccosukee peoples and their ancestors for whom land was standing on. The Maroons came. They came because the spring provided fresh water. It provided a place where they could watch the river to make sure that no uh, American forces would come after them. It provided a place that probably had spiritual significance as well. After the Maroons were gone because of the destruction in 1821, Josiah Gates came, settled, and built what ultimately was the village of Manatee. Houses were built, there were stores, there were shops. What is so empty now was it's built again and again. The Curry family bought the land, used it. There was an apartment complex built, or started to be built in the mid 20th century. It was only in the late 20th century that it was made into a park, the Manatee Mineral Spring Park. First, actually, Indian Springs Park. Archaeologically, that means there was layers and layers of history. So what we see on the surface here is the present day, soon to be turned into a park for a river walk. Under that is the mid 20th century remains. Under that early 20th century, late 19th century, mid 19th century, and then only under that is the maroon level. And so in doing the excavations as part of the ethics of archaeology, we need to go through all that material. So in my first uh, work here, we did very small excavations. It was in January 2020 that we were able to open up and we're going through the materials to ensure that, that all those histories are represented and understood. At the base is the maroon history, and that sense of freedom seems to live on. That so much of the work here became, frankly, lucky breaks. We were lucky that Reflections of Manatee preserved this land and was committed to its history and to its archaeology. We were lucky that the excavations that I did, the small-scale excavations, found the right sort of evidence to make the case. We were lucky that Daphne Towns came, saw the sign, and engaged in festivals, the Back to Angola Festival, was bringing descendants here to celebrate which the local community embraced. That energy, that positive energy of heritage for this area, for the history by the Manatee Mineral Spring, led the city of Bradenton to fund those excavations in January and the Division of Historical Resources for the state of Florida to fund the lab work, all of which is allowing us to tell the story of Angola as just one of many histories here, many layers, right now deep underground, but hopefully still inspiring people. The tagline for many of their heritage interpretation signs you see for Reflections of Manatee is the history of this region flows from this spring. 
and this spring seems to be a really important component, even though it's fairly small. It seems to really be a source of inspiration for people to come here and to reflect on what kind of communities they want to build. And we know for the last several hundred years, they were able to build successful communities. So where we are right now is uh, city land of Manatee Mineral Spring Park. This area is going to be transformed into the eastern terminal for Riverwalk. So there will be, the spring will be uh, the uncapped. It's going to flow into a pond. They will flow into lagoons to get to the Manatee River. There's going to be new historical signs based on my archaeological work and the historic research that's been done. There's going to be a place for people to sit, to play, and to enjoy. The archaeological research was able to pull out the evidence from the ground so that when they do that transformation, they're not destroying anything because I've already captured most of the information through archaeology. So this will be a place for people to come and both enjoy but also to learn. And the landscape architects have been very sympathetic to the archaeology. They have been very supportive. They, they understand the significance of this history and are trying to represent it as best they can. This has been an incredible opportunity. Uh, I like to start it out. I was sitting in my office in, in, at New College of Florida when my phone rang and I picked up the phone. And it was Vicki Oldham who asked to come and see me. I didn't know who she was, but she had my name. She came in, and I often refer to her, she came in like a hurricane with this vision of finding the Maroon community. I knew about it from having read the couple of published articles about it. And we had an interesting moment. I understood all too well that people would not believe this story. They wouldn't believe the history. That recognizing that this area was a really important part of black history would take some effort. So I asked Vicki Oldham if we could start not by doing excavations, as most archaeological projects do, but by doing public outreach. And she was enthusiastic. By asking for input, we developed a wonderful grassroots groundswell of support. And that community support sustained the project. And it was such an important lesson for me to reach out, to ask for help, to ask for support. And it just has poured in ever since. Every step has come out because community members said, no, this really does matter. I'm Dr. Rosalind Howard, a retired associate professor from University of Central Florida. I became involved in this project when I met Vicki Oldham, who hunted me down at a meeting in Tampa in 2004. She had learned of my research about black Seminoles in the Bahamas and was interested in getting me involved in a project that she had developed called Looking for Angola. Well, as I began my research, um, I had already done a year of living in the community of descendants of people who came from Florida. We didn't know where in Florida they came from, and they didn't either. Uh, I had lived in Red Bays and on Andros Island, interviewing primarily elderly people who had had oral history passed down about where their ancestors came from, how they wound up there in that community. They talked about the bravery of their ancestors who took uh, rafts and canoes and any kind of ship they could get on to get away from Florida, seeking freedom in the Bahamas. We know that a lot of the people who wound up living in Angola came from various villages and black towns that had been destroyed by the Americans who were taking over uh, Florida. The people there did not know any point exactly in Florida where their ancestors had lived before they came to the Bahamas. Fortunately, I had a list of names that I mentioned that I found in the Bahamas archives of the people who were living in Red Bays. Well, in later years, Dr. Cantor Brown Jr. found a list of names of the people who had been captured here at Angola. And on that list, I found the names of some of the ancestors of the people in Red Bays, which was a tremendous find to connect them directly to this community. One of the uh, two of the people were Peter McQueen, who, according to this list, was property 
quote unquote, of Peter McQueen, who was a Seminole, and Scipio Bowlegs, who was the property of Billy Bowlegs. They both adopted that surname, so they became known as Scipio Bowlegs and Peter McQueen. So that is a significant story, I think, because it tells the story of how strongly people resisted bondage and made a way to find their, their way to freedom. And that's why we call them freedom seekers. I don't like the term fugitives or runaways. They were freedom seekers. Florida has a mandate to teach African-American history. However, that has not been really followed. And I think that this is a story that needs to be in the curriculum of the schools. So where we're standing right now is where we did the excavations. My team worked here. And so it's all looking like a simple field, but underneath here is a tremendous amount of history. The archeological excavations have recovered. And the work in documenting what we've done will take another few months but really years more to disseminate all the insights. But I can share with you now just some of what we found. That, of course, there's the top layers that were from the 20th century, late 19th century, from the village of Manatee in the mid 19th century. But I think what we want to focus in is that lower level that comes from the late 18th century to early 19th century, that period for Angola. And what you have here was a fairly thin layer it was here for a few decades, but more importantly, these are people who didn't want to be found. This is one of the challenges of the archaeology, that they did their best to avoid the slave raiders and the U.S. military, so they tried to not be that visible. And so now we're trying to do excavations, which is based on material finds, for people who didn't want to be found. So the challenges were great. But we're able to find really some impressive components. Not all have been fairly uh, confirmed yet, but at least give you a sense of what might be there. When right over there was a well. It's actually quite impressive. It was a barrel well, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, a barrel was taken, the bottom taken off, and it was put deep in the ground, and water came up. And it was preserved quite nicely. One of the questions we had was, with the spring right there, why would they have a well right here? And we also know that for the village of Manatee, where we have lots of writing, they never mentioned it. So the dating of the well isn't clear yet. We're still working on figuring out when it was, but it could have been associated with the Maroons. We found over there, in a rectangular wooden box, a dog burial. Again, we're not quite sure about this, but what looks like a medium-sized dog was put, obviously probably died, put into a box and buried in the ground. We found all across this area, and this is one of the things that was difficult when we first started doing the excavations, because I think everyone expected, particularly when they use the archaic term of escaped slave, right, I've been using maroon. Slavery is a condition, it's not an identity. I think there was an assumption these people of African heritage would have African things, but in fact, these people saw themselves as British subjects. We know that really well, that British officers helped to train them to fight against the United States. And they saw themselves as British. Because what we found, and the dating is really precise on this, uh, is goods mass produced from the British all across this site. They wanted to enact their Britishness. They had uh, trade connections to various traders who brought those things. And so we find dishes, it's a type that's called pearlware, as well as creamware. And from historical archeology, span we have quite precision on it, and it fits the time period. We have tobacco pipe fragments, that again, fits the time period. We have metal objects, nails and the such, from that time period, right? It's not the assumption that somehow they are living in a, a primitive spot or anything like that. No, they were people who saw themselves as British subjects, living British lives here in Spanish La Florida in freedom. And of the finds that we have, and again, still preliminary understandings, just about over there where you're standing, sir, we found the remains of a structure. It's post molds. So you put a wooden post in the ground. 
it's left in the ground, it leaves a stain that archaeological research finds. And so we found several of these post molds right there and on the floor level with two small pits, one next to the other. In one pit was a little ornament and the other was a piece of glass made into half a projectile point. And so we're assuming, and it is an assumption at this point, that those were ritual items put into the ground by those maroons. And so we have some really tantalizing pieces of a history of people living here, using British mass-produced goods, having some spiritual aspects, obviously the care for the dog, the well, providing water that might have been different from the water that's right there, various structures, and we're slowly but surely recreating that landscape for our Angola. We have work being done to try to find the pollen. We know there were fields because the Anglo-Americans 1840s wrote about the fields further uh, to the south, but some of the foods might have been here as well. Tremendous amounts, and it's not surprising, of fish bones and shellfish, including crab, because the river's right there, and that's what they would have eaten. Cows and pigs as well. Right? right now it's an empty field, but try to imagine, thanks to the archaeological evidence, uh, log cabins. Try to imagine horses and cows and pigs around. Try to imagine some dogs. Imagine nice white dishes and glass. This is the life that we're slowly revealing through these archaeological works, and it came from right under our feet. That those small, in terms of religious practices, the one time things we had was those pits with those looks like uh, ritual items put in the ground. One piece that was put into a pit by itself was glass that was snapped into half a projectile point. Projectile point or arrowhead, I guess, might be the other term for it. The other is an ornament that either was held uh, cloth together or maybe something else that looks like a G shape. And that was obviously intentionally put in the ground. We know from a lot of good research on the Congo belief systems for people who had been enslaved here in North America, and that burial of metal goods is part of a long tradition of spirituality. Archaeological research is sometimes the only source of information. And in this case, it really is the only source we have in these maroons. They did not write about themselves. They had no opportunity to do so. The people who saw them as property did not present them as fully human. When we think about religious items, those tend to be fairly sacred and so tend not to appear in the archaeological record. And even if they somehow are in the ground, we have to be able to find them. So the lack of evidence is never proof of anything. I'll leave you one other piece. Right? One of the things that is important with any kind of scientific endeavor is to have debates. And when I was doing the initial excavations right over here, people appropriately criticized my interpretations. They held up. That's why we were able to do the larger scale. As I am releasing the information we have from the analysis of these materials, again, appropriately people are critiquing sometimes inappropriately, but mostly appropriately critiquing. <laughs> we found through the excavations a half cent from 1808, exactly the Angola period. And it, uh, it was when we looked up, the, and we had it verified by the Bureau of Archaeological Research for the States, that it was known as America's unloved coin. And so we think of who could have had this, it's actually quite feasible that someone who had been enslaved could have gotten one of these almost valueless coins, kept it with them, somehow got down here, and it got entered the ground. 1808 is perfect for the Angola level. And so we have this wonderful kind of point that says, yes, this is the time period, along with all the ceramic and other evidence. So this project, the excavations were funded by the city of Bradenton and the lab analysis has been funded by the state of Florida's Division of Historical Resources. So that's the, I have, we had more than a dozen people excavating last in January of 2020 
and I have a three person lab crew working today and have been working for the last few months in going through all the materials, washing them, identifying them, cataloging them, and ultimately we're going to be analyzing all of it. The next steps, of course, are going to be to do more work to disseminate the information through scholarly publications and popular presentations. And one of the nice things of having you all here is I don't want to be the only voice of this. I want people to be interested. Every, all the work I'm doing is available and accessible. And my hope is some of you will take on various components of it and share it in any way that you find appropriate. There's years more work to be done to tell the whole story of this maroon community. It takes a good amount of effort to kind of situate the people of Angola within the larger world. They in fact would not, although the conditions here in the summer would have been as hot and humid as we all expect, that with all the pine trees and swamplands and others, you can just imagine there being all sorts of uh, animals, snakes, possums, raccoons, might have been panthers coming through, black bears. Obviously the river has both food, but also sharks and the rest, right? It's need to not imagine though, that somehow they were out of time, but they were in the early 19th century. And there was a contest for Florida and for North America ongoing between the French, the English, the Spanish, Native Americans trying to retain their homelands and Af people of African descent trying to gain their liberty. This was actually a hotbed of activity. There were several schemes to come to Tampa Bay, to this area, and march people to St. Augustine to conquer it. They were, had ships bringing goods, weapons, as well as foods, and those ceramics I mentioned were all part of this. They were very much part of a larger world. There were people from Cuba on the coast fishing and bringing tremendous amounts of fish to Havana for the world market. The Native Americans, the Seminole Miccosukee, as well as Creek, were coming here. The deerskin trade was an important economic component, again, with trade to Havana. There were Americans coming down to uh, Key West and trying to create new opportunities. This was a hotbed of activities. These maroons were part of something much larger. We know from the later period, just 15, 20 years later, not people like Abraham, who was multilingual, who went to Washington, D.C. to negotiate with and for the Seminoles as the U.S. military was making war against them. These were really impressive people, and they were part of a much larger set of world events. Now all we have left is the things they used in their daily life. But we want to use that as the avenue to remember and honor those lives they lived. So there's a lot more work to be done. There's all this research has been done in partnership with Reflections of Manatee. And they have a series of small houses, historic homes that they use for both research and for exhibits. And our next kind of stage of research is building those exhibits so that once the pandemic is done, people can come and see the actual evidence for Angola. So they can see the things that people used as well as the analysis and interpretation of it. And Reflections of Manatee could use volunteers. There's a lot that they can do to help. Many of the particular objects need more interpretation and people can help with that as well. We know that Angola was destroyed in 1821. The buildings were burned down some hundreds of people were taken, uh, captured and taken into slavery up in Georgia. Others had escaped. There is, we were always conscious and concerned with where would we find human remains. And so we looked, we made sure there in fact are no human remains here. This is where people lived. They weren't putting, we don't know where they buried their dead, but this was not there. And when we were excavating, we were always conscious to be concerned about it, and there was no evidence of any human remains. So it would have been somewhere else that they would have. And it makes sense, you wouldn't, the spring is here, the water is flowing, you wouldn't do it right in the water. It would probably be more deeper inland. And there's tremendous development from the city that either has buried it or destroyed it at some point. So we have the archeological site 
And it's one of the ironies of uh, archaeology, it's a sad irony, that we find things because things are destroyed. All right, it's, the destruction means it's here. 1821, the United States gains Florida from Spain. Andrew Jackson had already led several military expeditions in the Panhandle in 1818 at Suwannee. Andrew Jackson was representing a viewpoint that there was American property in Spanish Florida, right? That racist mindset saw human beings, and it's so same to even say it today, but saw human beings as property. And the property was just running amok in his world view. And he organized several expeditions to capture what he saw as property, as upsetting as it is to repeat that as words. In 1821, just as it's being transferred, Andrew Jackson asks uh, Calhoun, who is the Secretary of War, what's now the Secretary of Defense, for permission to come in and capture, quote, slaves. It's rejected. Secretary of War says no, but Andrew Jackson has a close ally who's a Creek political leader, a military leader, and they come in in a slave raid, and they come explicitly to capture people. And so they come down, there's a newspaper account that Cantor Brown Jr., the historian, found from Charleston, and referred to the terror that spread down the west coast of Florida that broke the communities of Indians and African Americans. About 300 people were captured. Hundreds of others escaped either to the in interior of Florida or to the British Bahamas. Thanks to the work of Roslyn Howard, of those lists of people, two of them escaped and they got to the Bahamas. So we connect Angola directly. I'll say we have those lists of names, people like Jim and Nancy, because they were lawsuits. These people actually were born in freedom and people were claiming them, but there was no basis for the claims. Florida had been a haven for freedom for generations, and it's painful, but the people living here in freedom were seen as property, and people were arguing about who actually owned it, and in many cases, it took years to resolve because they were lying. But of course, slave owners, the racism is all built on lies, and so it shouldn't be surprising that the legal system was facilitating those lies. So we have those snippets, but only from the views of those who were seeing the people as property. The people who lived here were a threat to slavery. Andrew Jackson was correct. If he wanted to sustain his slave-based plantation and that of his friends and allies and neighbors, this had to be destroyed. Because as soon as you saw that people wanted to be living in freedom and would be successful, it gives lie to the racist assumptions that there's inequality of people. They were able to destroy it, and what it represented was just never recorded because it wasn't going to benefit those who were running academic institutions at the time. And even today, the descendants of some of those academics continue to fight against this history. Yeah. It, it's not over at all. Wow. They are still, and the term is appropriate, racists, who really believe that only certain people produce important works, and others just are not worth looking at. And so we're in a constant battle hmm. to reveal this. This has been a project that found success but I can assure you at every moment it could have failed, faltered, and you wouldn't know any of this. I had, and I'll speak bluntly, those who really were angry at me for the work I put into this. Almost all of it was volunteerism. And I always found people who came forward and volunteered their time, their effort, their expertise. If they hadn't, if something else had come up, if they had made a different decision about the use of their time, we would not be here with this exhibit for the Angola community. It's a very thin reed that allowed us to expand on this, and we want to make sure that it doesn't get erased again. 
The research on the early 19th century maroon community of Angola has multiple components. I've been focused mostly on the archaeological aspect. The other component is that dissemination. But then there's the third part as well, that this is people's heritage. They are people today who are descendants from those freedom seekers. They were able to find the fortitude to escape, some to the Florida interior, others across the Everglades, across the Florida Straits, to Andros Island in the Bahamas, where they were able to reconstruct lives in freedom and liberty that have lasted to the present day. And capturing not just the historical and archaeological materials, not just displaying the facets of history and material culture, but that spirit of Angola, that spirit of freedom-seeking people that's here in Bradenton and Mandy County in Florida is also part of this research project. And it's why as we do this research, we want to make sure that we reach out and bring as many voices as many perspectives so that it's meaningful, not just for what happened, not just for today, but hopefully inspiring for future generations. That this is something that has to be understood well. We live in difficult times. The Maroons lived in much more difficult times, but they believed in their future, and their descendants have benefited from that strength. And so we have that as another component of this research and of this history. It's a heritage that's beneath our feet, but hopefully continuing onward as we lay out all the complicated details of it and hopefully shared with others and others will expand on what we understand from what happened here by the Manatee Mineral Springs 200 years ago. It has been a research journey, but a spiritual journey too, to find um, this settlement and to tell uh, this story. I want people to know the lengths that people um, sought and went through to, to find their freedom, to embrace their freedom, to, to keep it. These people came from chattel slavery the worst forms of slavery, and I think about what they had to endure, that they went through it, and actually a remnant survived in Red Bay's Andrus Island. That was a powerful message to me for the transition that I was enduring. Wow, if the people of Angola and the Angola settlement made it through their challenges and uncertainties, then surely I can because I have more resources than they do. That's the message that I want um, people to take away from this story. But people just need to know African American history, period, that we came here and that we accomplished and we helped to develop Manatee County, Sarasota County, the surrounding counties, the state of Florida. That was the powerful message too, that blacks just didn't come here during the Civil War. We were here, you know, building this community into what it was. We were working on these um, sugar plantations and, and so forth. And that is something that was not ever taught to me in school. And so I am delighted I am excited that this story resonates um, and is beginning to develop its, um, its sea legs. It's that archaeology piece that people seem to be really, really excited about when you start digging underground and bringing up um, artifacts and that sort of thing. Um, that archaeology has kept the story uh, going. In, uh, in large part. Maybe it's because people like to, um, you know, get their hands dirty and, and um, find hidden treasures. But we've done a lot of talks um, in this community, in the Bi-County community, and we're hoping that um, more education can be, that can be done.